Hey guys, Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today we're going to be talking about drinking water and why it may cause you to burp. I get these questions all the time from patients that have chronic digestive issues. We're going to break it down and look at the underlying physiology. Uh, before we do, please smash that like button. It really helps the search algorithm. And I'd love to see your comments down below on the topic. All right, guys, so let's dive in. So when you drink water, water's got a pH of about 7. And so when you're digesting food, you have a pH of about two, two and a half or so. Typically, you have acids going on there that lower that pH. Acids are very important for activating digestive enzymes because enzymes are pH driven. So that nice low pH activates a lot of proteolytic enzymes, which starts the protein digestive process. Ideally, all that food that's kind of going into that stomach, we're chewing it up really well. So we have, it's nice and small. We have more surface area so that acid and enzymes can work on it. And that good acid also closes off that esophageal sphincter so you don't have a lot of reflux potentially coming up. And so when we look at burping, the first thing is, is there food in your stomach? Because the first thing is if we have food in your stomach and we have any type of indigestion, that food is not being broken down all the way, that food is going to ferment, potentially putrefy or rancidify. Essentially, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are rotting in a sense. And that in itself can give off gases that potentially could cause burping, especially when you smell like if it's burping where you can smell like rotting food, that's usually an indigestion of the food. It can also be because you drank like, let's say, some carbonated water with bubbles with CO2 in there. And then you're, you're burping because of that CO2 is just releasing it. So you're smelling a foul burp because you're smelling the food still in the digestive process. It's still there being broken down. So that's kind of one scenario is you have the effervescence of the carbonated water coming up. You have, you're just drinking water with food that, which is raising that pH up back to a more neutral pH and you're having indigestion and you're smelling that rotting food. Very important. Like one of the easy low hanging fruits I tell patients when they're having this burping issue is don't drink water with your food. That's the first thing. Or if you take it like an ounce or two, just enough to kind of maybe get your pills down if you're swallowing some supplements or swallowing some digestive support, just not to get your pills down, but you don't want to be hydrating with a meal. Just kind of save your hydrate, hydration for 10 to 15 minutes. And if you have an issue with burping a lot, make sure that water is not overly cold. Make sure it's room temperature because your, the water that you drink will sit in your stomach longer to raise that water up to about body temperature, you know, in the 90-ish so they can move through your body and not create shivers. If it's super ice cold water, it can potentially create shivers and can create impede peristalsis if it's very cold because your body's going to be like, whoa, this is almost hypothermic here. We got to shiver and create friction so we can generate heat. And so it's very important if you have any um, tummy issues to begin with, make sure your water is, you know, room temperature is a good idea. That way it goes into your body faster. You can also take a drink of water, hold it in your mouth for 10 seconds. If it, if it is really cold, five, 10 seconds, let it warm up in your mouth and then swallow. That's a good option too, right? Just to get the temperature up because you want to make sure that water can move through your intestinal tract easier and not have to suck up your body's energy to do so. So room temperature water is good. So avoiding the hydration while eating, making sure we have enough enzymes, enough hydrochloric acid, because if you're on the fence, I can drink a, like a glass of water if I, if I needed to, as long as it didn't have bubbles in it. And I wouldn't get burpy at all because I have enough enzymes and acids. So just make sure you have enough enzymes and acids in general. So if you, you know, easy low hanging fruit is add a little bit of hydrochloric acid in, add a little bit of enzymes and see how much you feel. And then once you've done that, test it, see how much you can handle. Cause there may be, maybe able to handle four to six or eight or 10 ounces. But in general, my rule of thumb is always hydrate, you know, 10 minutes earlier. So I'm going to go have a meal. The first thing I'm going to do before I prep the meal, I'm going to go and get my two glasses of water, add some sea salt to it, and then prep my meal, and I'll be ready in five or 10 minutes, and I'm good to go. So it's just about kind of reorganizing your routine so you don't hydrate during you hydrate before. Now, I have some patients that do that, and they still get really, really, really burpy. They still have a lot of burping. Now, a lot of times there could be some gastroparesis happening where that food is not emptying the stomach adequately. A lot of times you'll see it, the kind of my written rule is like, 10 to 15 minutes before a meal or two hours after a meal. So the patients that get caught up in this, they have gastroparesis. A lot of times that food is not emptying the gut in that 60 minutes to two hours. It's taking three, four, five, six hours. And so they're drinking three hours after a meal. They're like, Dr. J says, you know, at least two hours, I should be fine. But I'm not. What's going on? Well, it's possible you have a delayed emptying. You delayed emptying because that the nerves in that intestinal tract and that gut are 
not firing optimally and you have a delayed emptying happening from that food sitting in there longer. So if we look at like what gastroparesis is, it's essentially those nerves are not communicating. You have a delayed emptying. So the definition officially is a disorder that slows or stops the movement of food from your stomach to your small intestine, even though there's no blockage, right? What's the main cause of it? Diabetes, nerve damage, vagus nerve. So if we have a lot of stress, a lot of sympathetic nervous system stress, a lot of adrenal stress, that can be a thing. Diabetes. So forget diabetes. What if you have, what if you're pre-diabetic? What if you just have a lot of high blood sugar, a lot of fluctuating dysglycemia problems that are impacting your nerves? Because remember, high blood sugar causes glycation that impacts nerve health. So what if your blood sugar is just chronically off? What if you're just eating a lot of processed food? What about your microbiome? What if you're really negatively impacted your microbiome, all that beneficial bacteria by taking lots of antibiotics, maybe eating lots of processed food that has glyphosate and it's knocking down that brush border, knocking down your beneficial bacteria and that's in impacting motility as well. And then you have this delayed emptying from your stomach. It's possible there as well. So I see patients that have this delayed emptying from their stomach. They drink three, four hours later and they get burping even with water. It's like, well, there's nothing in there. If, if the water has no bubbles, there's no effervescence, there's no CO2, it's not a sparkling water, and there's no food in there, there should be no fermentation to create the gas to begin with. So why is that happening? So that delayed emptying is there. And so we have to look at testing the gut, seeing what's happening in the gut. We have to look at using bitters or motility enhancers to make sure things are emptying adequately, whether it's a ginger, gentian, chamomile, whether it's orange peel, whether it's anise, Right? These are good bitters that have been used for centuries to kind of help with motility and have that delayed emptying. Also, I tell patients that have this delayed emptying process, you know, make sure you cook your foods well. Like use an Instapot. Make sure your foods, there's nothing raw in there. Nothing raw. Use an Instapot, soup, stews, or just more sauteed, broken down foods. Make it easier. Add in more enzymes. Add in more bile support. Add in some hydrochloric acid. See how much that moves and it helps. Now, hydrochloric acid can be a double-edged sword because it can be helpful at motility. But if you over increase your acidity in your stomach and your stomach lining is more thin, now that food's sitting in there instead of two hours, now it's sitting in there four or five hours. Now there's a greater chance that acid could be problematic, right? Could irritate the gut lining. So that's why I say lean on an enzyme, lean on bitters, make sure your gut lining is dialed in before you start testing the acids. That way we don't cause any, you know, gastritis or any ulcerations. We don't want to overdo that. So you can always test it with more gentler acids like citric acid, lemon juice, lime juice, or apple cider vinegar, acetic acid, start with a teaspoon, dilute it in like an ounce or two of water, and then just shoot it down right before a meal. That amount of water should be okay. And the acidity you're adding in should give your system a little bit of a digestive support. And then adding in the Manuka honey and some ginger juice tea, it's going to be wonderful for that gut lining, but you got to look deeper. Again, high blood sugar can be a problem. Sympathetic nervous system over adrenal stress can be problem problematic because that can really cause that vagus nerve to be suppressed which is part of your parasympathetic nervous system response. And that's going to cause a lot of that blood flow to move away to the extremities, to the arms and legs to fight and flee, which is part of that prehistoric sympathetic response. We've got to get the parasympathetics going. So prayer, meditation, all those things, appreciation are really good to get the parasympathetics going. Make sure you're breathing through the sinuses, the nose, that a lot of olfactory nerve fibers plug into the parasympathetic nerve branch. So that can be very helpful for activating digestion, just good, Deep sinus breathing, four seconds in, four out, and then into the nose, out to the mouth. You can do both. You can do both, but definitely in through the nose to get those parasympathetics going. So kind of recap, chew your food up well. Avoid hydrating with food. There could it be still delayed emptying. So even hydrating two and three and four hours later, which textbook should be okay, may not be. Using bitters using motility support compounds. If you have any ulcerations, we may need to add in healing, soothing nutrients for the gut line and using ginger tea, manuka honey. Get your adrenals looked at because the sympathetic nervous system can basically squash that parasympathetic response. And then on top of that, I would say um, get your gut looked at. Dysbiosis, antibiotic use, the imbalance in the microbiome, good to bad. Now it's bad to good, right? More bad than good. That can impact your motility and cause chronic digestive issues. All right, guys, if you want to dive in deeper, my contact info for my team will be down below. If you want to reach out and get to the root cause of whatever digestive or health issues you have, there'll be a link down below where you can find out the next steps there. All right, guys, Dr. Jay here signing off. Hope you guys have a phenomenal day and put your questions below. Take care, y'all. Bye.